Hello and welcome to the Critical Eye Asia podcast, inspiring leaders to succeed. These podcasts are part of you, um, but also very much an expansion of a subject matter. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. Engaging though on subjects at the forefront of business leaders' minds. Always topical, thought provoking, and enabling you to learn from leaders and peers who have and continue to deliver amazing results. So today we are here to explore stepping up. And I'll explain a little bit more what I mean by that. But it's also, it's a way in which one can look back and reflect on what you would, might tell a younger self. What you did not know then that you would like that younger self to know now. So stepping up is when you move to the heady heights of a country or regional role, where you're situated at the top or perceivably at the top, one or two steps away potentially from global if it is a global organization. And all around you, you're suddenly expected to deliver on things that you've never had to deliver before. As a leader, you are there to be able to be the point of reference and to take people forward. So what does a first time senior exec need to know? Now, to help explore this subject, I feel very, very fortunate to be with William Lowe, who is amongst many things, a critical eye board mentor, but also a global portfolio entrepreneur, chair, advisor, you name it, and of course, non-executive director. Now, William is renowned for being the founder of Netvigator, the largest internet business in Hong Kong, the first interactive, I hope I'm getting this right, William, the first interactive and on-demand TV service in the world at the time. And aside from a stellar executive career across technology and media, he's also been involved in retail and e-commerce, been involved in education, financial services and consultancy and probably some other things that we will bring in. So a very, very broad and diverse career. So lovely to have you here with us today, William. So what, Hi, we're, going to you, what we're going to, I suppose a good place to start would be to get an overview of your career in, a, in literally in a nutshell, if you can, a walnut shell, if, that, if that's all right. Um, and then we'll pick up on some of the, the themes that um, are particularly relevant to this subject of stepping up. And what, what we're also going to do is just be mindful of, in the role of stepping up, the economic environment within which people are operating at the moment. And then we'll be able to explore, I think, two particular roles where you saw and we will recollect on what it felt like to be able to step up, what was demanded of you, and look at that from the perspective of what you did well and what you might have done otherwise. But also, I think, getting a perspective from you in your portfolio career, what you look for in prospective CEOs. Okay, so let's start off with a intro to you and a little bit about your career. Well, first of all, thank you, Charlie, for inviting me to this uh, sharing session uh, set. Um, I, I started my career, well, I was a neuroscientist by training. That's my doctorate is, is in. Um, and uh, but I, right after I got my PhD in Cambridge um, back in the 80s, I, I've decided that um, that is perhaps not a, uh, a lifelong career um, I would like to embark on. Um, so I move on to the commerce side, business side of things. And I was lucky enough to be able to make that transition move um, via McKinsey and Company. So I joined um, McKinsey, the consulting firm in London, um, uh, right after my PhD. Uh, firstly in London, then I was kind of like shipped back to Hong Kong to help McKinsey to open the Hong Kong office. Um, and typically after a few years, uh, I learned the tricks of uh, management um, business strategy, uh, corporate finance, et cetera, et cetera. I was asked to join one of my clients <laughs> and, um, and that was the telephone company in Hong Kong at the time. Um, so that was um, in late, no, late 80s, um, early 90s. And uh, at a time when um, 
the telephone industries is very much the, going through a deregulation um, process. So a lot of things opening up for competition and all, um, all organizations, all telcos in the world, so-called, um, has to go for a transformation um, from a monopoly to a competitive organization. Um, so I was there and I was also lucky enough to be able to involve, as you said, in the early days of internet um, in the 90s. Um, then after that, after eight years in the, in the TMT sector, I made a quite a, uh, a big um, significant stepping up um, of, uh, of uh, joining the Citibank and become the, the CEO of um, C Citibank uh, Greater China at the time. Um, I spent a few years there and then um, I moved back to TMT sector. But in this, that particular case, uh, it wasn't the, the, the technology and the telecom thing um, who is appealing to me, but rather uh, because it is, uh, it is a Chinese telco, um, the China Unicom, one of the largest state-owned enterprise in China. Um, they invited me to join their board as an executive director. Um, looking after their whole IPO process in Hong Kong and New York, um, as well as uh, in charge of their listed company in Hong Kong. And, and at that time, I took that, that particular challenge. It, it is because um, that was the year 2001. And, and the whole world after the IT bubble is looking for the next big thing. Um, yep. I still remember that I kept being asked in the... Um, in the in, in various media interviews saying that what do you think about the next big things after the after the IT bubble and I said the next big thing is not about a particular industry it's about a place called China um, but and then I asked myself do I know enough about China I said no actually not I, I was born in Hong Kong raised up in Hong Kong educated in UK um, I speak Chinese I, I write very good Chinese but I'm I, I I didn't know China that much at the time. Mm. So when the chance of joining Unicom uh, came, I thought this was a very good idea. So I joined China Unicom for a number of years. Um, then as you said, I, I, I came back to Hong Kong and, uh, and from then on, I, I did various consumer retail business, firstly in, the, in fashion retail. Um, I helped IPO and other fashion retailers in Hong Kong. Um, back in 2006. And then after that, after a few years there, um, I also do consumer retail in toys. I brought Lego to Hong Kong and China as well and got that particular company IPO'd in the 2018. Um, and then the, normally when I do a project like that, it's, it's like a five years project, three to five years project, and I reach certain of my own KPI, then the, I step down and step up to another thing. Um, uh, which is came to my um, the last two years I've been working with uh, you know uh, Jackie Chan um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, a few other friends on a new um, entertainment platform um, it is is very much like a Chinese version of uh, the American the entertainment app called uh, Masterclass so we are doing a Chinese version of Masterclass in Hong Kong so uh, a, a nutshell but in general basically in, at any one time other than just the, the big project, the core project I'm, I, I, I'm kind of like uh, focusing on, um, I still do um, advisory and uh, in-net or net work uh, for various listed companies. Currently, I'm an in-net of um, nine listed companies all around the world and a few other uh, uh, private um, companies as well. And then the last bit is um, I normally, uh, I still chair about three NGOs in Hong Kong, um, mostly focusing on the education and, uh, and, and youth um, development as well. So in a nutshell. <laughs> that's a very, um, that's quite a large walnut, but um, that was needed to be covered. So thank you very, very much indeed. And you continue to be obviously very, very busy. Let, let's, before I suppose we develop the theme about stepping up, let's just be minded of the backdrop against which, which we are operating at the moment, because I think it is significant and it is important <laughs> when we discuss this, other than my backdrop here, yeah, um, is... So Your backdrop we, is only critical eyes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so the, the, the sort of economic backdrop is, is a very different one. So oh, okay. we obviously had the first pandemic in 100 years, 
Um, we have had the first invasion in Europe um, in 75 years taking place. We have inflation that is um, abounding and increasing and probably hasn't been at this level since um, 40 years ago. And this therefore signals obviously a change in what leadership is required and what is required of a leader, I should say. It's an inflection point. And therefore, it's arguably the place at which there's new waves of innovation and leadership are required. What, what's your observations on against that backdrop? What leaders need to do at the moment, would you say? What, if there are perhaps two or three things that are very, very important, what would you say they might be? From an well, I think, I think, yeah, I think, Charlie, I think that, that that's a very difficult one. Um, because, well, for example, we have been um, engaging in all this discussion um, in various uh, critical eye events over yes. the last two, three years. Um, yeah. And if we were talking about this three years ago, no one will, no one can forecast about all these things, is it? No one can. I think the, the key thing is um, uncertainties is becoming a norm. Yeah. Now, so when uncertainty is becoming a norm, the, my, my, my thinking is if you can, identify anything certain within the uncertainty and build up on that is what I meant. Now, um, um, and then you will have a chance and opportunities, uh, no matter what other uncertainties are coming. Yeah. Um, for example, we talk about, um, I still remember in the, uh, in the um, um, NED forum a few days back, um, we talked about digitalization. Now, that is a trend. That is something for sure that will linger on for years to come. That yep. won't change. That will be even becoming more and more important um, as part and partial of daily life, um, the, the post-pandemic norm. So that is something certain, despite of uncertainties. You, whether you have war, whether you have you know, inflation, you know, pandemics, et cetera, et cetera, digitalization will go on and on. So I think for any individuals or companies, we need to take that very, very serious. And there are other things, but obviously that is a key trend. Um, and um, uh, so, so I think being able to identify in your own industry or in your own um, sector, uh, own countries, the key trend, which is having a lot more certainty, uh, certainties within an uncertain environment, that will take you a long way forward. No, I think that's a, that's a very nice way of looking at it. And, it, and you know, whether we're looking at supply chain issues, now we know there is a big issue about supply chain at the moment that might present an opportunity for someone to come up with a solution, whether that is a data solution, um, who knows, but it is about putting in place a solution, competing with someone who's probably working in, under the old system and not operating in what might be required going forward. Um, the other obviously challenge that people are going to deal with is capital and not having access to capital. Um, what, what sort of challenges do you think that brings for organizations? Because inevitably over the last 20 years, well, since 2008, capital has largely been made available and very cheaply. That might have made people a little bit idle in terms of understanding its significance and its importance. So suddenly that's going to change. What, what does one do as a business leader to respond to that challenge, do you think? Or is it, as you say, that's the certainty and therefore we know how we need to navigate through that? No, I think, I think capital is um, obviously the last 20 years or so have been on the relatively, relatively on the cheap side of things. Yeah. It's, it's a lot easier. And I think um, um, uh, given the, the, the interest rate scenario and everything, um, capital firstly will be more expensive um, yep. and would be more difficult to get as well. Um, but I'm sure that if you are in the, in the right industry doing the right business model, you will still get access because it's not about that, because the people risk appetite are, 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 are not that good at this time. Um, but uh, people still have the money to invest. I was I was talking just this morning. I was talking to a 
um, a PE fund in the ABC and PE fund. Um, they do doing both VC and PE in, in China. And they just finishing off a 7 billion, you know, US dollar fund. And I said, well, despite this, 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 you know, and, and uh, uh, this kind of environment, how can you still be able to do it? You say, you said, there's still money around, but, but they are very, very cautious. Um, the risk appetite, as I said, is not that high anymore, yeah. but they are yeah. still looking for, as I said, key trend. For example, um, I talk about digitalization. We still think technology will, will, will keep going, especially in, you know, in areas like AI, in data, um, in, the, in the meta space, um, they will still be going on. And the other thing is, is about health. Um, I think because of the yeah. pandemic, um, a lot of people are looking at health tech, a lot of people are looking at healthcare system reform. Um, so these are the things that, so money will still be there. Um, they would be a lot more cautious to, to put into investment. Um, but if you're in the right industries, if you have the right business model, uh, I'm sure that um, giving the assets of capital is, is more and more difficult. Um, you will see in a lot of traditional um, sectors, there'll be a lot of consolidation and things like that. So capital will be much, a lot more focused and concentrated rather than before. Um, it'd be relatively easier to get access to cheap capital. Good. Well, it's not so good, but I mean, that, that what creates opportunity. And so with a consolidated market, then there are people who are going to move in to seize that opportunity. And it's and arguably, given what you said at the outset was, it's about identifying something that is certain. And that's always been the case. Wherever you were stepping up, it's about the ability of that individual to be able to determine what might be certain in an uncertain environment and having the capability to bring the team around you to be able to shape that, but also for you as a leader to ensure that you are taking time out to set the strategy. So that leads us neatly onto stepping up. I suppose what would be useful is, is for you to think about a role or a couple of roles that you felt at the time were perhaps a, a leap in faith by the employer where you thought I'm going to seize this opportunity where someone put faith in you in terms of what you might have been able to what they thought you might be able to bring and what you could deliver um, this is where people are finding themselves at the moment and I think what's very important is to give them a level of comfort in terms of what they are stepping into and if you would remind mind us what it felt like the challenges that you dealt with and equally what you might have done differently when you look, look back. Would you like to take us through a, a couple of examples of, if you have, of any of those roles? Yes, I think, I think um, um, during my, all my, you know, all along my career, um, there involves a lot of stepping ups, as, as you mentioned, because each time you, you step into a new organization, and in particular in a, um, in a different industries as well, um, you have to step up yourself. To the challenge, um, and um, I, I had quite a few examples of that. You know, as I mentioned in my early days, um, I had a scientific background, and then I learned through business and strategy and finance uh, via McKinsey. Then I joined the telephone company, and at the time that was, uh, you know, in the uh, in the late eighties, um, and telephone companies are mostly monopolies in you know in in the world. Um, and um, but actually at that time, um, the one of the reason they, they hire me is saying that because the company and the whole industry is going through a, a process of deregulation, and so you have to move on from a monopoly to a to make yourself a lot more competitive, and and that involves a cultural change. So you see, um, you were talking about the 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 the, the board or the, the the company has a. It has a trust and faith in you, in bringing you in. Um, you have to step up, but they actually, they are actually stepping up their game as well in hiring someone yep. um, to an organization. In my case, they hire me because they want to change agent, okay? When you think about stepping up, a lot of the time when you're going into something, doing something different, um, mm. that you have to change and the company is changing as well. So you have to match that 
and align that um, and, and find a common objective. Um, so I spent a lot of time before I decided to join the company in really talking to, at that time, I, I, I was recruited as a director of strategy um, at the GM level, reporting to the CEO directly. Okay. Um, and it's, it's a new position. So, so, but I was young. I was much younger than all the other GMs. I was 29 at that time. And, wow. and all the other seven GMs in the organization are 50 plus. So that is a huge cultural change thing. Um, you have a 29 years old helicopter in. So the key, the key challenge for me at the time is how to get the recognition and how to get the yep. trust um, and build a working relationship. William, so that was a- I just ask, yeah. when you stepped into that role, did you realize just what the chasm was that you were getting into, getting yourself into? Oh yes, yes, absolutely. I, I spent a lot of time because, because the, the telephone company was my client. So that yeah. was one of the good things. So I yeah. have been working along with these old GMs for um, over, <laughs> one, over one and a half years in four So you were, known, you were a known entity. Yes, a known entity. But even that, you know, being a third party consultant and, yeah. uh, you know, brainstorming and working out strategy and having a pine at the end of the meeting is a good mm. thing. But then suddenly you, you come in and sit at the same level as them. It's, yep. it's, it's a different challenge. Um, and, and you have to establish that peer-to-peer -peer thing. Um, um, and, but, but that is exactly what the board um, wanted to do at that time. Um, they, they were thinking about if they have to move um, from a monopoly to a competitive um, company, the key thing is, well, which when I was in McKinsey, identifying the study saying that the biggest thing is a cultural change. Yeah. And how you bring a lot of cultural change, if you have the same people, that's very difficult. So you need change agent. But that, that, that involves a lot of more than just like when you are a consultant, but you are doing you know, logical thinking, problem analysis, strategy formulation, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually go into a, um, a corporation mm -hmm. and, and the way I jumped in and stepped in like that, it takes a lot about people management. So a lot okay. of stepping up depends on the extent, but a key part of stepping up is about how you work with people, um, yeah. whether it's the board, um, you know, above you, your peer, and your, you know, um, your direct reports. Where do you focus? Because you've only got so much time in a day and you've got to do things in the right order. So can you remember, it was a little while ago, but and, we, and it might well be there's another role we can look at where this was uh, equally apparent. Can you remember where you started and, and perhaps what you did and didn't get right? Well, if I look back, I think, I think, I think, I think even when I was in McKinsey, we, we helped yeah. a lot of companies went through this, this change management, you know, cultural change, yeah. you know, um, emergent and acquisition. My yeah. so, so we have all this here. Yeah. We're actually doing it. It's, doing, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's very different things <laughs> yes. because um, we're always saying that consultant is easy. From A to B is a straight line. It's the fastest way. But in real life, it's like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, if I if I have to if I well with hindsight, um, yes, I yeah. think um, I think I can do it with more patience. For important, uh, okay. um, firstly, because relationship takes time to build. Yeah, yeah. Trust takes time to build. So yeah. um, um, you can't fast track that, and and so being able to to build the trust and work with something together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so the process is very important as well. Um, it's not just the result, the process, whether you, you are engaging in certain tasks, um, whether you, you succeed or fail, it doesn't matter sometimes. It's a process of engaging people. So that is a skill. I think I, 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 I learned a hard way when I was with, um, with the telephone company, but subsequently, yeah. um, yes. as you mentioned, in the following stepping ups, um, this was like, with City, wasn't it? With City, when you like, like, in, like, yeah, like, like, like in City. So, 
I, in that particular one, I, I, I was stepping in not just another huge organization, a global bank um, in one of the largest at that time. And I was stepping into a new industry as well. I have yeah. no particular um, industry experience in banking. Yeah. Um, but, the, but the board and the chairman at that time, the Citibank, uh, Citigroup chairman was John Reed. Um, yeah. he, he gave me a lot of assurance. He was, he was actually very visionary and, and, and told me, because when, when I had that, that interview with him, I was, is, is I interview him, not he interview me, because they have done enough, you know, um, background works on me already. Um, but I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I was shocked to be, I was surprised at least to say um, that um, they're interested in someone who is a non-banker to actually not even in a, um, executive role, but really taking up the, the CEO role. Mm. And, and, and he was saying that, you know, um, his vision is at the time, and that was um, 1998. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and he was saying that um, his belief in is technology, um, well, put like this, no matter which industry you're in, the underlying thing, key theme is about technology. Whether it is front end of the banking is about internet in the future, or the middle office and the back office is about technology as well, and about data as well. And it, it was very, very visionary in, in the late nineties in saying that. And even more so, um, he said that actually, you know, in our organization, we have a lot of expertise in banking products we know inside out about banking. So I don't need another banking guys. Yeah. I need yeah. someone to come in and being able to have certain technology background and know about how can leverage, leverage, he used the word, and that's a very important word. Um, that is perhaps, if there is one word I learned when my, even in my McKinsey day is about leverage. Mm -hmm. You being able to, to get something and leverage that and then yep. because leverage is talking about multiple times. So you know about technology and you've been able to leverage that with, you know, and work with other, um, you know, specialized or specialist experts in a particular industry. So I went, I stepped into city um, and I know that I was surrounded by people, bankers. Um, they know banking inside out, risk management inside out credit card, mortgage, et cetera, et cetera, inside out. And I being able to tell them, hey, um, how can I, how can we leverage technology to make the organization, the banking, uh, a, 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 a better place to serve our customer? You know, that's the key. Um, so, so you know, that's, yeah, yeah that's stepping in, actually involve not only um, into a new organization of which mm. the people management thing is very, very important. Yep. But it's also being able to tell the people that, hey, I'm here to work with you. I know you are the expert and I, 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 I need how that. Did, did um, that. How did that wash, William? Because <clears throat> effects with us saying, you're the CEO, you're supposed to know where we're going, William. Um, you're supposed to know what we're about and what we're doing. Um, we can just pull the wool over your eyes, by the way, because you don't know what we're doing. So how did you know that you were getting what the information you needed? How did you know the wool wasn't being pulled over your eye? And how did you leverage that, that position that you're saying you were presented to in? Well, it, it, takes, it takes a bit of convincing to do, actually, um, yeah. um, because um, the, the key thing is, the key underlying thing is, um, we were saying that, it doesn't matter which industry you are in. Yeah. The key thing, whether you are a bank or you're a telephone company or you're a fashion retailer is the same. You're trying to find the best way to, to develop a, the best value proposition to your customer. So when everyone is focusing on the customer um, yeah. and how to provide them with the best you know, value proposition, it doesn't matter which particular product it is, even yeah. in a bank whether you're providing them a mortgage, as I said, or credit card or a time deposit or whatsoever, they're still the same. Um, um, so I would say, hey, hey, we get all these, you tell the guys, we get all these fantastic um, uh, banking products already. Mm -hmm. Is 
is the way to actually serve the customer that's better. Because as a matter of fact, banking, insurance, and a lot of other things, they are getting less and less you know, differentiation between products. People can copy products very easily. You can do that. I can do that. I can give a higher interest rate. You can get a higher interest rate. <laughs> you know, I can get free grips for it to apply for a credit card. You can do the same as well. Um, so it's about you know the, the distribution, and it's also about the, um, the 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 services you give the customer, um, which is matters. So we have to think along all these things, um, and so so you'll be able to tell the product guy that um, you're actually working with them, being able to help them to actually you know serve their customer much better, and and together we have the vision of propelling the bank or, or stepping up the whole organization of stepping yeah. up the bank. I think that is important. It's not just just we are doing stepping up. There's a whole organization is stepping up. Very, very interesting. And, and I think therefore it's also about aligning the organization in terms of what their real strategy was, which was in actual fact customer delivery, probably customer acquisition as well. But it was the consumer and what you're delivering to them. Therefore, did you the one one question for you? Was it difficult to determine? given you didn't have that, the expertise, who were the good and bad deliverers? So, because you need to have the right team uh, uh, with you, because if you haven't got the right team, you're not gonna be successful. How did you determine, given you didn't have that technical knowledge, although you did say that could be overcome, because we're all focused on the customer. How did you know whether someone is delivering or not? Um, I think for the, for the first two examples I use is, yes. is it was relatively easy because um, they are both, you know, um, in the first one, the telephone companies, because I've been consulting for them. Um, so I know, yes. the, I, know the, I know the people well. Now yeah. City, I, I, um, most of the executives, most of my one down, um, I, I didn't know them before I joined the company yep. actually. Um, so it takes time to understand, but obviously I have faith in, um, in a, in a, in city because they are a, a very good organization. Um, yep. They are renowned in, in training up some of the best bankers in the world. Um, yep. So most of them now, but having said that, uh, it's not whether individually they are good. More importantly is whether they, the, the, all of these people could work with me together as a team. I think that's the key thing. Um, um, and it's like similar to any football team. Um, no one particular star can, you know. Um, yeah, I, I'm a, I'm a supporter of Man U, as you know, and we have Christian Ronaldo, but you know, but still. <laughs> um, um, so, so it, how to make the whole team work is very important. Going back to one of the point, the key strategy is very important. I think um, the when I when I when I went to City, the 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 the, the first thing I do is um, during the first three months. Obviously, I use up a month to. To, to learn about some of the key specifics, um, you know, products and organization design, and you know, uh, met with all the key executives, and, and not just the one down, but plus the, the two downs as well, because there are a lot of very good potential people there as well. But within three months, um, I um, actually host a, a strategy conference involving all these people. Um, and, and the strategy conference is is um, we are having the, the top 100 people of the bank yep. joining in. And I collectively, working with my, my first time, which is about eight people at that time, at the executive committee, and work together to create a strategy um, going onwards. So you have to have buy-in from the people. And that is very useful um, um, too, that actually we have all the buy-in, you start working with people, you create something together, um, and, and, and you actually, going, when you go, went through the process, you can identify uh, the goods and bad as well. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. and people will have the same wavelength, share the same belief as well. So starting from there, of the strategy, then we work on the next step. All right, and that's very helpful. Um, let's move on to a different lens and perspective as the final piece, which is in your role as a non-executive director and as chair, because one area I would have thought that may, may or may not have been apparent, particularly in the role at City, 
was in actual fact your role as regional CEO and your relationship with the chair, potentially, who probably saw that you might have needed a different kind of support, even though you're not the, 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 the um, CEO of the total business, but there might have been additional support coming in from above in the new role that you had. When, as a chair or non-executive director, you've seen someone step up into a new role, is there an example where you felt it necessary to be able to extend more support, to be able to nurture in a slightly different way, to mentor that individual? I think, I think um, 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 these days, because, uh, you know, from the telephone company to the city, yeah. And, you know, the staying enterprise, Chinese Unicom, I joined, and subsequently, I think um, over the last 30 years, actually, um, that, that I've been working at both board level and the, and the CEO level as an executive. Um, to be frank, um, the, the working relationship and the support between um, the board and the CEO uh, I should say there's still a lot of, you know, room for improvement for most yeah. companies, for yeah. most companies, even for the, for the, um, for some of the biggest, you know, city is a big one, um, mm. but some of the companies I work in is already, China Unicom is one of the biggest in, uh, still enterprise in China, um, but there are always a, a disconnect sometimes between the, the board and the, the and the executives. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, it should be a, a both way process. You know, uh, the, the chief executive or the executives, um, uh, the executive directors should be able to leverage more from the bank, uh, from, the, from the board, um, the, the, the expertise um, uh, and ideas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and vice versa, I think the board, rather than just, um, being able to, to look at, well, the annual plan um, or maybe the three years development and strategy and, and the capital expenditure approval. Um, I think, I don't think enough effort is being put into developing the next generation of leaders for a company. I still think that um, if you look at the board agendas, yeah. um, I will look at executives we might have the HR directors coming in and talk to us and talk about succession, succession planning once a year. But I think given that um, with this fast moving environment and people um, rather than product, I think is, is even getting more important to a company's success or not, um, that the board, any board should actually put into the agenda a lot more in nurturing and bringing the bringing in the best executive how to nurture them and you know um and how to develop them i think i think um i to be frank i have over the last 30 years sit in more than 35 listed company boards mm -hmm. i would say a large number mostly of them um haven't actually put enough effort or resources and timing into talking about nurturing um, the, the, you know, the, the executives and, and the people there. Interesting. I mean, I know that um, at our most recent Asia retreat, when we asked um, all those attending, what was their priority? And we listed a number of um, choices they could make. Um, and it was from supply chain to um, setting strategy to responding to COVID, et cetera. Also in that was talent. The, the talent came out as being the theme that needs yes. to be responded to. I think they know it's an issue, but they don't know how to deal with it necessarily. Um, for one final question to ask of you, and there's many um, areas we can take this subject. It's been fascinating. So thank you so much indeed, William is because I think this is something where there might be a disconnect that you've spoken about between the board and the executive and that is working from home and and 
Um, one observation I would make is that there is the old guard who feel that the office environment is the only place that business can operate from effectively, whether it's the office or whether it's on the work floor. Um, business has moved on. It, it is a place where there are many ways that we can operate. And COVID has illustrated how effectively it can be delivered. So it's bringing together that it's the hybrid that can be created. What is your observation on a new leader stepping up into that new role? Because ultimately it's about them setting the tone. What would be your advice to someone about how they set the right tone for working in the right way? Producti productivity wise, it's got to be at the right level, but also it is that lifestyle balance. Well, I think, I think, I think although I, 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 over the years I've been working in technology and all these forefront things, um, I'm relatively still a um, quite a traditional guy. I, I still believe in you know seeing people, shaking yep. hands. Yep. Um, but having said that, I think the pandemic has has changed um, the landscape quite uh, quite a bit. Um, but but that is not a it's by default. It's sort of by design. I think. Yep. Um, yep. I I I think you're right. I think the the. The way forward is going to be an omni model, as, as they said. <laughs> um, so it, it would be a hybrid anyway. Um, I, I think it depends on the industry you're in and depends on how your team um, is good enough in, 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 in working on, um, uh, on digital media stuff like, 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 like the Zoom where we are doing it. Um, I think. Uh, um, it would be it would be a different model for each company, but I still think that no matter which model, the human element is still very important, yeah. and and being able to sit together in a room to discuss um, is still a relatively slightly different thing than have ten Zoom you know windows there. I, I still think so. Um, uh, for example, the 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 the, the the, the, the latest project I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing, um, I have a team in Hong Kong, and obviously the last couple of months I'm here in London. Mm -hmm. I have a team in Shanghai. I have a team in, in Beijing as well. So by default, we, we wouldn't be able to get together most of the time. So we have we have Zoom meeting all the time. But I do, um, well, I'm actually looking at the calendar. When when can I go back to Hong Kong and then going to Shanghai and then going to, to Beijing? Yeah, yeah. I, I still think that that, that that part is very important. I don't think there is a a um, a formula to this. I think each um, uh, company would be very different, and each industry would be very different as well. But when you're going back to the the point about new guys coming into play yeah. because yeah. you might know that I, I wouldn't name it but I I'm having you guys to to board mentoring um, um, <laughs> and uh, a CEO executive in China at the moment yeah. um, he's new um, and he went through because the last couple of months uh, like Shanghai has been uh, locking down you know and yeah. a lot of cities are going through some very changing quarantine environment, et cetera, et cetera. But we, when we talk, we still think that when a new guy comes into an organization, it mm -hmm. is very important um, in, the, in the early days to, to meet people in person and being able to, as much as possible, group the team together to build a bond. Um, so that, that, that going back to the physical meeting is still important, especially in early days. When we are when 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 the team is is uh, knowing each other very well, robust enough, then then that particular um, uh, uh, type of physical meeting might might be less important. But in the early days, for new new guys stepping in um, or stepping up, you know, um, it is very important. I still think. No, I, I I get what you're saying, and I think. One thing I would say is that with us having gone through this process together of using this type of medium, we've all gone through the same education at the same time. We're all at the level playing field. And uh, any part of leadership is knowing what tool to use at the right time. And each tool has its part to play. And again, it's what you said, it's about leverage. It's about you leveraging what is available to you, making use of those in order to get to where you need to. William, it's been a real pleasure to catch up. Been a real pleasure to catch up with you. Um, 
Thank you very, very much indeed. And I hope these insights, I'm sure they will actually, because there have been some very powerful sound bites that you've delivered to us this session about the opportunity that Stepping Up presents. And to some extent, the opportunity that it always presents, as it presented to you back in the, the 90s, there's other wonderful things that people can step up to and, and jump into. Thank you, Charlie. I think, um, I think it's a very good chat. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the last comment I have is probably um, for any you know, um, younger um, executives stepping in and stepping up into an organization, a particular position, you know, just enjoy it and take it as a challenge. I mm. think um, these days is, say for example, when you're talking about um, a uh, insight into a particular industries, um, it is relatively easier this day because of information abundance, um, mm. you know, because of the internet and uh, availability of different, um, and well, obviously, um, we have like an uh, organization like Critical Eye um, can provide a lot of guidance mm -hmm. and information for a new executive. So yeah. I think um, that's just being able to talk to other mentors or talk to, you know, um, uh, key executives in Critical Eyes and, and people who know different industries is a, will, will get you a head start for your stepping up as well. Mm -hmm.